Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Briar Hangdahl Windwalker. So, um, I believe it was last week in discussion, I mentioned that if I looked hard enough, I could probably find somewhere a sutra to discount the teachings of every other sutra in existence. And um, as our discussion or, or our, our topic rather for the evening is uh, Platform Sutra chapters uh, 8, 9, and 10, I'd like to say that uh, Huy Neng has done all of that work for me in a very concise, uh, small section of Sutra. He repeats a variety of themes and uh, variations on them and oppositions to them so much that it's kind of like a, a great Zen work of jazz. So I'll start with a couple of them here, and I think there was a challenge posed to me. So we'll we'll see. I, I think maybe the second one of these quotes uh, might meet the challenge, but. To meditate on purity is an infirmity and not jhana. To restrict oneself to the sitting position all the time is unprofitable. And that's followed by a living man sits and does not lie down while a dead man lies down and does not sit. On this physical body of ours, why should we impose the task of sitting? Now, on the other hand, to continue with, with the master, you may read the sutra a thousand times, but you will get no benefit out of it. Or even if you confine yourself in a mat shed for further study, you will be a jhana scholar of secondhand knowledge only. So we take from this that it is profitless to sit, to read, or to study. So a story. A young seeker hears about the, the Pure Land, and he wants to journey there very badly, to be at the Pure Land, to, to further his cause of dissatisfaction with his life. And so he approaches an old Zen master who he, who he finds sitting outside of a temple to talk to him about it. And he's, he's the kind of Zen master you really picture, you know, looks a little crazed, bushy eyebrows, skinny legs, pot belly, might even have a knife hidden under his robes. You're not sure. And he tries to explain that he wants to go to the Pure Land and, and he wants to, to seek Amita. And, and the master says, well, why would you want to do that? You don't even know how to read or sit. And our seeker says, well, but in the Pure Land, I would be in the right circumstance to know these things, to find peace, to find bliss. The master says, okay, well, usually it takes thousands of lifetimes, but I'll, I'll give you a shortcut. And he gives him directions up into the mountains, where at a certain point, he will find a great gate. And through the other side of the gate is the pure land, Anamita. And so this young man, our seeker, he gives away all his possessions and he shaves his head and he puts on a simple robe and he, and he starts out on a journey of 10,000 steps. And he passes through many hardships and many, many experiences. And all day as he walks, he chants the sutras and the mantras. And at night, he sits zazen and focuses. And finally, after a very long journey, he comes to the place where he was told, and indeed, there's this great, beautiful, majestic gate. And he approaches the gate, and through the gate, he can see off in the distance Amita sitting in, in profound concentration. And he's so excited to reach the destination, and he, and he grabs the handle on the gate to open it, and it won't open. 
and pulls on it and it won't open. And so he's looking at it and he's looking at the hinges and he's looking through it and there's not enough room to climb through the top and and he's really beside himself because he's journeyed so far to get here and and he looks and there's a piece of parchment attached to the side of the gate and he can't quite read the words but he can sound out the characters and so thinking this is the mantra to open the gate he stands there and he concentrates with every bit of of mind and energy and he recites this mantra through a thousand times and nothing happens and so he sits down perfect posture in front of the gate and he sits and he finds purity and he clears his mind and he shoves away all thinking and he focuses intently on the gate and nothing happens and then he hears a noise and he looks and here comes that crazy old master walking up towards him approaching the gate the master looks at him and just starts laughing because these kind of guys do that all the time. They just laugh at you. And then he finally says, what, what seems to be the problem, young man? And the heart seeker says, you know, here's I'm, I'm at the gate and I've chanted this, this mantra and I've concentrated and nothing's working and the gate won't open and I can't get through to the pure land. The old master says, well, that parchment there, that that's not a mantra I, I told you to learn to read it it just says notice latch is broken please go around and he says and you know if you were sitting here instead of trying to to eliminate all thought and turn yourself into an inanimate object and you'd opened your mind you might have noticed there's there's no wall or no fence you could have just walked around even if you couldn't read the notice but before you think i have saved you let me ask you this, as you now know, to go around, and I'm leading you to the pure land. Is that the end of your journey? What's next? So now you're here. And he shakes his ring staff at him, turns around, and walks the other way. So we go back to, to the Platform Sutra. And here, here is what the master has to say to us. If I tell you that I have a system of law to transmit to others, I am cheating you. What I do to my disciples is to liberate them from their own bondage with such devices as the case may need. Hui Ning was the iconoclast of iconoclasts. If you painted iconoclasts in perfect characters on a parchment and hung it on a temple wall, he would shred it up and eat it. Because everything, every sutra, every prayer, every mantra, every meditation technique, every Buddha, every pure land has the potential to become a stumbling block if that's where we stop and that's where we get stuck. It's said in the sutras, enlightenment itself is a stumbling block. What do we do? We kill the Buddha. But even killing the Buddha is a stumbling block. You move beyond that and you move beyond that and you move beyond that and you go around the gates. If I knew what happened next, I'd tell you, but I don't either. So this is as far as I can go with this, but there is a note in, in the text that says the Buddha's object is to get rid of bigoted belief in any form. He would preach non-eternity to believers in eternalism and preach neither eternity nor non-eternity to those who believe in both. And Weening followed that with, whenever a man puts a question to you, answer him in antonyms so that a pair of opposites will be found. But I caution you, that's not dualism. <laughs>